We fought for the future, destroyed the invader, and brought to our homeland the laurels of fame. A glory will live in the memory of nations, and all generations will honor her name. Long live our Soviet motherland. Built by the people's mighty hand. Long live our people, united and free. Strong in a friendship tried by fire. Long may our crimson flag inspire. Shining in glory for all men to see. She lie, who's the one so nulla di run man? La woman di sera, tu chong woman sing di chong chong. Chong hua ming tu dao liao, sui wei xian di shi hao. Mega run de bo jo ba chu sui hao di hao chong. She lie, she lie, she lie. Arise, you who refuse to be bond slaves. Let's stand up and fight for liberty and true democracy. All our world is facing the chains of the tyrant. Everyone who works for freedom is now crying. Arise, arise, arise. All of us with one heart, with the torch of freedom, march on. With the torch of freedom, march on, march on, march on and on. We would like to welcome you to leading up until tomorrow, the International Perspective on Legal, Educational, and Political Imperatives to hold the U.S. government accountable and end human rights violations now. On behalf of the, in the spirit of Mandela Coalition, we welcome you. We do apologize for the slight delay, um, but we're really glad that you're here. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. This is Matt Meyer. That was Dr. Aisha Muhammad. We're two members of the coordinating committee of the International Tribunal on Human Rights Abuses Against Black, Brown, and Indigenous Peoples uh, to be held in October 2021, uh, virtually, and here in New York City. Uh, that was Paul Robeson, of course, not one of the, the songs that you often hear on his greatest hits albums, but one we thought worth playing uh, because this is a special forum on internationalism. Of course, Paul was a great internationalist. So we welcome you. We are extremely excited with all of the special guests and speakers tonight. And without further ado, uh, in the uh, in the chat, you'll see uh, the Spirit of Mandela website, and uh, you'll hear from other people who are who are here uh, in the chat. Uh, it, I, it's hard to not say. Mm -hmm that were extremely excited and in addition to recently freed political prisoners like Jaleel Munsequim, we also have the almost just yesterday freed political prisoner, Jan Lahman with us. So we, we, we send a special welcome to them and, and to all of the others. Uh, and without further ado, back to Aisha to start introducing our very, very special guests. Well, it's my pleasure and my honor to introduce Dr. Mary Louise Patterson, board member, Physicians for a National Health Program, daughter of William Patterson, which is, who was a co-petitioner with Paul Robeson of the historic 1950, 1951 We Charge Genocide filings to the United Nations. Welcome, Mary Louise. Thank you very much, Aisha, and uh, good evening, everyone. It's an honor for me to be here amongst you. I want to thank Professor Matt Meyer and the International Tribunal and everyone else responsible for conceiving and organizing this event tonight. 
and for inviting me to talk about the We Charge Genocide, the Crime of Government Against the Negro People petition, edited and submitted by my father, William L. Patterson, and Paul Robeson on behalf of the Civil Rights Congress, CRC, to the United Nations in December of 1951, 70 years ago this year. The actor, writer, Paul, <clears throat> playwright, and social activist, the wonderful Ossie Davis wrote in his preface to the petition in the 1970 edition of the book of the same title, the following. We say it now, we will submit no further to the brutal indignities being practiced upon us. We will not be intimidated and most certainly not eliminated. We claim the ancient right of all peoples, not only to survive unhindered, but also to participate as equals in man's inheritance here on earth. We fight to preserve ourselves, to see that the treasured ways of our life in common are not destroyed by brutal men or heedless institutions. The story of the petition begins in the post-World War II period. The defeat of fascism that was determined to rule the world left Europe and Japan in ruins. The raw horror and trauma of gas ovens, mass deaths, the homelessness and statelessness of millions, the unprecedented destruction of property was the landscape of indescribable, indescribable misery and suffering that the U.S. captains of industry and finance hoped to capitalize on and ultimately did. But at that time, the desire for an international body devoted to preserving world peace was ardent. There had been two world wars within 30 years. The U.S. had rejected the list of nations coming out of World War I. It had no excuse this time to the emergence of the United Nations with its claim to be the new leader of democracy and peace. Pat, my father, as he was affectionately known, had read the UN Charter carefully and realized that neither the US signature on the UN Charter nor the housing of the UN ultimately in the United States would or could change the status of black Americans. His experience with the Scottsboro case and having been educated in the University of the Toiling Workers of the World in Moscow in the late 1920s and early 1930s led him to know that, quote, there has never been, is not now, nor can there ever be a reconciliation of the aims and purposes of a racist state with world peace, end quote. He believed that if Black Americans could see themselves as part of the many peoples whose freedom struggle had brought the United Nations into being, they could see the United Nations being the instrumentality through which the Negro question, as it was called then, could be lifted to its highest dimension, the world political stage, and the hypocrisy, duplicity, colluding, conniving, repression, and deception of the US government, especially toward its Negro citizens, could be laid bare for all the world to see. In other words, real true democracy in the United States was a cruel hoax. He thought about the role the CRC could play in bringing out the truth. In his autobiography, The Man Who Cried Genocide, he talks about how the role the U.S. was preparing to play in world affairs was a reactionary one and would endanger world peace, how prescient he was. So it was after the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was passed by the General Assembly in 1947, but the U.S. abstained, and to this day the U.S. Senate has still to ratify it, that those from the CRC decided that the presentation of a petition charging the U.S. government with the crime of genocide and thorough documentation, with thorough documentation, would broaden avenues through which the struggle of the Negro people could move forward. That was a quote from Pat. The CRC petition differed from the prior petitions as it made the specific charge against the criminal and racist policies of the U.S. government and the destructive impact this had on the nation as a whole, but especially on its Negro citizen and, citizen and its impact on world peace while the prior petitions sought redress for wrongs. The CRC understood that the United Nations couldn't change a specific government's policies, but its rostrum was on the world stage and quote, the black man could announce that until flagrant inhumane injustices of racism had been beaten, no quarter of the globe could be safe from those seeking freedom. In that regard, the CRC was the first organization in history to charge the U.S. government with the crime of genocide. 
Those in the CRC also knew this meant an all-out ideological attack and therefore firm proof was a uh, firm proof of the crimes was essential. This was the US government's Achilles heel and they were going straight for it. <clears throat> they were going to have to they were going to have to document in, institutionalized oppression and terror and expose its roots which were embedded deep in the US capitalist economy. Pat consulted with many the grand exalted ruler of the Elks, J. Finley Wilson, and Reverend Hill of Detroit and Reverend Walls of Chicago with trade unions, educators, prominent liberals, and leading law schools. Responses were expectedly along color lines with liberal whites opposing, including Professor Raphael Lemkin, the father of the genocide convention and known for coining the, the term, the word genocide. Pat and Paul met many out met many times for many hours discussing the project. They chose a staff of writers, historians, researchers, and lawyers. They agreed to a small number of signatures. Ultimately, 94 signed the petition, among whom were W.E.B. Du Bois, Mary Church Terrell, Jessica Mitford, Eslanda Good Robson, my mother. Um, Louis Burnham, the father of Margaret Burnham, lawyer, who was just appointed by the Biden uh, White House to the Civil Rights Cold Case Records Review Board. It was decided that Pat would present the petition to the United Nations General Assembly in Paris and Paul to the UN Secretariat in New York on the same day, December 18th, 1951. Before leaving New York, Pat sent 60 copies to himself to a post office box in Paris, and 60 to himself in London, and 60 to, to Budapest to a friend. He carried 20 with him. Pat managed, he left on the 15th of December, and he managed to meet with, immediately meet with the French Communist Party leaders. He also secured a travel card that he was told he should get immediately that would allow him at a moment's notice to leave France in case the French government at the behest of the US government rescinded his stay in France or the US government decided to cancel his passport and remand him home immediately. So he rushed to where the assembly, the general assembly was meeting to distribute the petitions he had with him. The one sent to Paris and London never reached him. Pat managed to meet with numerous delegations, all of whom in their own precarious negotiations with the United States or England or France, and couldn't see their way clear of publicly supporting, not to mention actually presenting or co-presenting the petition, even though privately they agreed with it and applauded Pat for his effort. That very evening, he received a telephone call from the US Embassy telling him his passport was canceled and he was to return home forthwith love that word. He told them go to hell and suspecting the French police were on their way to his hotel, he left it and went to the airport. That night he left for Budapest via Zurich. What ensued was indeed the stuff that espionage movies are made of. The US chased him all over Europe. He always managed to keep one step ahead of them while somehow managing to give press conferences, talks on the radio and garnering much and in the main positive um, uh, news coverage. Of course, there was absolute silence in the U.S. press on Pat's travels or Paul's delivering of the petition to the Secretariat until Walter Winchell, the Rush Limbaugh of his time, denounced with lies and vitriol Pat's trip and Pat himself. Upon return to the United States, Pat was taken into a secret room at the airport. His clothes were thoroughly searched, as was his luggage. He refused to be strip searched, but he was patted down repeatedly <clears throat> and his passport was confiscated. This was a clear attempt to humiliate him when he finally emerged from inside the airport to the awaiting crowd led by Paul. Tears of rage clouded his eyes. Paul, recognizing the huge indignity he probably suffered, immediately embraced my father for several long minutes. I'd never seen my dad cry. I stood there with my favorite doll next to my mother, bewildered by the look on my father's face. I'll never forget that look. Pat was then to ensue upon a speaking tour in the United States talking about the petition. Shortly thereafter, the CRC came under US government repression and attack. 
Pat was jailed and the CRC finally forced to close. In the meantime, my mother, Louise Thompson Patterson, along with the actress Bea Richards, wrote a call to Negro women to defend our precious and courageous African-American male leaders who were under attack, W.E.B. Du Bois, Paul, Pat, Althea Hunton, and others, as well as the Black community at large, forming a group called the Sojourners for Truth and Justice, the precursor, I believe, of the Black Lives Matter movement today. The petition, which was put into a book form in 1951, had the photo of Paul's hand on it, his index finger, plaintive, uh, pointing accus accusatorially um, at the US government. The 1970 reissue featured a preface by actor um, uh, Ossie Davis that I read from, and it has been re and the book has been reissued again by the Communist Party with a new preface by Jarvis. Jarvis Tyner. In the late 1970s, the Black Panther Party approached Pat to update the book with more recent evidence of police brutality and state repression. Um, that's a task that remains to still be done uh, and hopefully will be taken up. I want to thank you very much. Wow. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mary Louise, incredible history, personal and political, and uh, obviously many, many tasks still to be done. Uh, you know, some of us, uh, or some, some folks in general have been talking about this tribunal as we charge genocide 2.0. And I think all of us have uh, said in our work that when we look at the, the, the strong and amazing shoulders we stand upon, it was your mom and dad, it was Paul Robes, and it was so many of the people you mentioned that uh, in this era, obviously many in, in generations uh, past and, and ancestors uh, unnamed, but in this last era, there's a certain lineage from that 70 year old call that we hold on to. And in many ways, the next breath for most of us is that uh, the work of Minister Malcolm X, El Hajj Malik El Shabazz, in the formation of the Organization of Afro American Unity, uh, took the next step of bringing uh, charges uh, or beginning to organize to bring charges of uh, US uh, abuses, uh, human rights abuses, and abuses against peoples. And, imprison nation um, uh, to the international arena. In that sense, there can be very few uh, guests that can be as significant in looking at that lineage uh, than our next speaker, who was a founder of the Malcolm X grassroots movement, a founder of the new African People's Organization, and uh, more than that, a true spiritual, academic organizer, bringing all of those elements together in a in a very special way. Because when you look, uh, when you when you Google his name, not to give too much attention to Google, but one one looks to find information. Uh, one of course can find many prestigious universities, law schools that he's taught at. But the first one you'll see is George Jackson University, which speaks to to uh, the emphasis uh, of, of all that he's done. I will say a little piece uh, more of an introduction because I really want us to hear from him about especially some of the tribunal work that he's been part of. But just to say, Dr. Kwame Osegiefu Kalimara was also the former Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Provisional Government of the Republic of New Africa, a professor of law, psychology, history, and so much more. Uh, Dr. Kalimara, please welcome, deep respect and honor to have you here with us. Well, thank you very much. When you started with that introduction, I didn't know who you were talking about. And so I hope that in some ways I can live up to uh, the uh, accolade and introduction you've given me. Uh, I would like to say to the group present, Frida Lamb, 
I wish to give thanks to Ultimate Morality, the mother, father, creator, and all of us. I'd like to acknowledge our ancestors and the elders of whom shoulders uh, we stand on. I am uh, clearly honored to be able to bear witness to the, uh, uh, the story, uh, the narrative shared by Dr. Uh, Patterson, because I look at the work we charge genocide as indeed foundational. But before I share a few uh, pieces of my narrative, hopefully that will give some context and some insights into the work that we're going to do. I wish to say that uh, I'm honored also to, to be able to share this space with Lennox Hines. Um, he may not remember, but the first time I met him was in either 1976 or 78. It was in New Orleans at a National Conference of Black Lawyers uh, convention. And at that convention, I was asked by Dr. Matul Shakur to basically substitute for him in terms of making a presentation on behalf of the National Task Force for Cohen-Fell Pro Litigation and Research. Many of you may be aware of the fact that that entity used the Freedom of Information Act to uh, get the files, the FBI files, to be able to use in many of the court proceedings which activists were being uh, charged and held, et cetera. Uh, it's important to also note that the National Task Force was a creation of Dr. Matulu Shakur, uh, Fanny Shakur, and with the assistance of Coltrane Chimaringa, and the offices at that time were with the uh, ancestor uh, Ron Dellums. And so I think it was important to be able to, uh, to, share, uh, to share that. I think the uh, second or third time I saw uh, Lennox Hines was in 79. At that time, I was with the um, back, part of the faculty of the National Conference of Black Lawyers Community College of Law International Diplomacy, Charles Knox and David Hammond, uh, co-founders of that institution. And uh, Lennox uh, brought a number of his lawyers to interview a number of the people at the uh, Pontiac and State Bill Correctional Facilities. And we know of that work. So I think it was uh, important for me to make that acknowledgement in terms of the the work that he's done as an international lawyer. Uh, given um, Matt's sharing my relationship with the Provisional Government of New Africa, I want to say that I first was introduced into the New African Independence Movement in 1969. It was through the um, leadership and tutorship, tutoring by uh, Dr. Ray and Julian Richardson, who own the Marcus Bookstore, the premier bookstore in San Francisco. But it wasn't until 1971 when I met um, Amari Obadelli, who was one of the RNA 11, which uh, many of us might be aware of that on August the 18th of 1971, there was a, uh, a shootout, which obviously the RNA 11 survived, but uh, there was one casualty and it wasn't us. But it was due to the work of Mario Bedelli. I met him at the Marcus Bookstore and I began to follow his work, his legal work. He wrote the article, uh, the article three brief. He spoke about uh, sovereign immunity. He spoke about political prisoners of war. He used international law as a tool. And it was with that insight that was shared with me by Dr. Uh, Imari Obadelli that I began to do work with a number of the political prisoners and prisoners of war uh, assisting in writing those, those petitions. Yes, in the uh, 70s and early 80s, I was the Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Provisional Government. But what was important was the continued use of international law. While in Chicago, I introduced international law to Kara Mosley Braun, who at that time was the state senator for the state of Illinois. Uh, Dan Danny Davis was a uh, council person. 
Uh, we use international law when we form the National Black Human Rights Coalition. And many of us might be aware of the fact that on November the 5th of 1979, there were over 5,000 people marched on the United Nations charging genocide. And uh, we presented a petition to Salim Salim, who at that time was the general uh, secretary of the General Assembly. What was also more important about that was is that that march uh, actually followed the uh, uh, the liberation of Asada Shakur on November the uh, the second. And the point I want to make is is that we have to make certain that international law is always visible. Matt had talked about some of the tribunals that I participated in. Well, in two thousand and seven. I was one of the uh, prosecutors on the International Tribunal of Katrina and Rita. The other uh, co-prosecutor was Joan Gibbs out of New York. We understood that it was important to use all of the uh, legal tools that were at our disposal. One of the things I found out in terms of the work that we were doing relative to the uh, um, uh, international tri tribunal. And we had um, justices from uh, Martinique, from Paris, from Haiti, uh, and various other places. But the thing that I found most interesting in working with many of the lawyers and support folks here in the United States Empire is that they were afraid to use and recognize the charge of genocide. And I think it's important for us to understand that fact that they were afraid of it primarily because I would say is that um, they were concerned about their certain privilege within their uh, their jobs, their university jobs, or the um, the law offices. But the point is is that it's important for us to be courageous and recognize that we have to call a spade a spade and and and, and move forward. And so one of the things I did for the International Tribunal on Katrina and Rita is I wrote all of the applicable law and made certain that everybody was aware of it. It was also important to note that there were government agents also who were present and they wanted to make certain that um, they were not really acknowledged being present, but it's important to know that. One of the other tribunals that I participated in was in uh, 2007, was at the Hague, the Permanent People's uh, Tribunal, the second on the uh, the Philippines. That was also a very important uh, uh, tribunal. I was an international observer, and I made certain that it was important for us to recognize the importance of our solidarity. The Philippine people were talking about the uh, horrendous uh, treatment and violation of human rights that they experienced. Also, in the same year, 2007, uh, I participated in Sao Paulo, Brazil. The um, various organizations were charging the military regimes with various uh, human rights violations, but also against the political movements and also the um, assassinations in the poor neighborhoods, what the Bra Brazilians call the favelas. And so I think that's important for us to, to, to recognize. Um, I also participated in a tribunal uh, dealing with Imam Jamil Alameen H. Rap Brown. I actually wrote an opinion. But I think to bring this to a close, this is important that we must recognize that we're in a war. We must recognize that there are political prisoners, prisoners of war, and exiles. The recognition of the war and the colonial status that exists here in uh, New Africa, in the United States Empire, the Puerto Rican, the indigenous native nations occupied Mexico, uh, Hawaii, Alaska, et cetera. It's important that we recognize that the only way that we're really gonna win is that the US empire must be dismantled. We recognize that for us to have the success, and we do understand the limitations of the United Nations and various international bodies. In understanding that, we have to understand we have to use it as a tool because it gives us greater context. We have to create critical mass to be able to fight white supremacy, 
patriarchy, capitalism, imperialism, colonialism, neocolonialism, and all other oppressions and exploitations. We must use every media at our disposal. One of the things that I do, because I, I currently teach at Spelman College, is that it's important for us to know, yes, what Fox News is saying, because we must know what the enemy is saying and what they're thinking. We must look at democracy now, the Guardian, Algeria, uh, um, Al Jazeera, but we must look at all other alternative medias and study because we must know the enemy, but we must know ourselves. What we have to do is create greater alliances, solidarity, coalitions, united fronts, and we must understand that the liberation movements must represent the, all of the rainbows of humanity. And so I think that I want to close there because I wanted to give you at least enough information to recognize that um, uh, we got a lot of work to do. And I'll just leave it at that. Free the land. Thank you. Free the land. Thank you so much. Um, wow, Dr. Kwame, you really left us a lot to think about. And thank you for all of your information and sharing of your experiences and especially just discussing how in the past people are afraid to charge genocide um, because of losing positions, um, et cetera. Um, so looking at our lineup tonight, um, I feel just like really blessed and really honored to be here. Um, the lineup that we have um, of doctors and professors and speakers tonight is, is kind of like a historic moment, at least for me. Um, we have so many, so many great people. And again, thank you, Dr. Kwame, for, for your presentation. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Professor Lennox Hines, International Association of Democratic Lawyers, convener of the historic 1979 petition to the UN on human rights violations in the US, convener of the historic 2021 International Commission of Inquiry on Systematic Racist Police Violence Against People of African Descent in the US, and also the lawyer for Nelson Mandela. Please welcome Professor Lennox Hines. Thank you, uh, comrades. Um, I would like to thank the organizers of this tribunal uh, for inviting me to speak. I listened to Kwame um, Kalamara, and he brought to my recollection uh, the number of uh, political prisoners that I have represented over the last uh, 50 years or more. Um, in particular, I was particularly uh, uh, taken back and remembering uh, Mario Bedali, the December 12th movement, and uh, other warriors who took the fight for the liberation of black people in the United States uh, to the international arena. Uh, I'm not going to talk about myself and my work that I've done. What I want to talk about today is the work of the International Commission of Inquiry of systemic racist police violence in the United States. And that commission was organized just after the brutal public lynching of George Floyd on May 25th of last year. And as you recall, there was an international outcry and outrage that followed that public lynching and hundreds of organizations petitioned the united nations to convene an international commission of inquiry to examine systemic racist police violence in the united states and that petition went to 
the Human Rights Council. The United States pushed back. The 13 member African member group took a very strong position supporting the convening of such an international commission. The United States went from country to country in opposition and threatening to withhold any financial support in foreign aid if they did to support the petition. The African countries stood firm in support of the request. But the pressures brought by the United States in opposing that international inquiry resulted in the Human Rights Council watering down a resolution. And in fact, they voted and agreed to form an in international inquiry because the United States did not want to be singled out. And so the Human Rights Council took a mandate to conduct systemic review of racist police violence internationally. When the International Association of Democratic Lawyers, the National Conference of Black Lawyers, and the National Lawyers Guild in the United States heard about this, we decided that we would convene such an international commission. And we drew our inspiration from the legendary work done by Paul Robeson and William Patterson in 1951. As most of you may know, in 1978, on Human Rights Day, this is December of 1978, the National Conference of Black Lawyers, United Church of Christ, and the, and the um, the, the Commission of Racial Justice decided to convene a petition to the United Nations. And that petition was filed in 1978. And in 1979, a, the International Association of Democratic Lawyers organized a delegation of lawyers from Asia, Africa, um, Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean to tour the United States and to interview political prisoners throughout the United States. So that was done. Now, here in 2021, this petition, this tribunal, not tribunal, but this commission that we organized, this commission brought together international experts. These are individuals who were esteemed in their profession from Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean. 12 international jurists. And they reviewed cases in the United States of the hundreds of cases that they considered, they selected 44 of the most egregious cases of individuals who were all unarmed, committing no crime. 
The only weapon they had was the color of their skin. These individuals were all killed by the police in the United States who were sworn to protect and serve and instead serve as executioners of our kids, young people. The police use a variety of, mem of methods. The commissioners heard them and heard the variety of methods. Some individuals were shot, others were strangled. Though there were those who were choked. People suffering from mental health were inflicted with 50,000 volts of electricity into their bodies. The police used their, their cars as lethal weapons in other cases. Those were the cases and the evidence that were heard. The cases came from 30 cities across the United States, the 20 states. The South, the North, East, West, Midwest, small cities and large cities. The pattern was the same. The hearings took three weeks, six hours a day. We had commissioners who were hearing testimonies. Some were in Japan, others were in India, some were in Pakistan. Some were in uh, South America, those were in the Caribbean. We had uh, commissioners in South Africa, we had commissioners from Nigeria. And all of these individuals, all experts, took time from their busy professional lives because of the importance of this. So we gathered rapporteurs, all of these rapporteurs were prominent lawyers and professors who assisted the commissioners in preparing their reports. The report is 188 pages. We invite you, this tribunal, to go to the website, which is inquirycommission.org. Use the hearings, which are all video. Use the transcripts in your proceedings as evidence because the findings of the commission, we found the United States violating not only its own domestic laws, but also violating international laws. And we found the United States have committed crimes against humanity. The evidence was consistent and irrefutable. Now you may say, well, uh, okay, so the United States was found uh, guilty of uh, crimes against humanity. But the United States has not signed the Rome Statute. So of what significance is this? It is significant because if you look at the actions of the United States, the United States does not want the international community to hold it accountable. The United States believes it is above the law. And we have a duty and responsibility to hold the United States accountable. Now, Joseph Biden, the new president of the United States, he says the United States is back. He says, you know, the United States, we are a country of laws. I maintain the United States is the greatest outlaw. 
The United States does not, has not ratified, well, first of all, you recall Bill Clinton during his last days in office, he signed the Rome Statute. Of course, he didn't have time to send it to the Senate for ratification. So it was not enforceable. Jim, um, George Bush, as soon as he hit office, he unsigned it. And that has been the situation that we have been in for over 30 years. The United States is not a party to it. However, as quietly as it's kept, if the United Nations begins an investigation, there are crimes that are considered in the international law, jus cogens. It means that there is international and universal enforcement. You remember the case of, of Pinochet of Chile. Pinochet committed crimes. In fact, while he was in office, he had legislation passed which said, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to worry. You have immunity. Guess what happened? He was vacationing in, the, in London and there was a knock on the door of his villa. And guess who it was? It was Scotland Yard with a warrant for his arrest, not for a crime that was committed in the UK but for a crime that was committed in Chile. And the judge who in fact signed the warrant was in Europe. What does that mean? It's a clear example of universal jurisdiction. So we want a situation where US diplomats are afraid to travel outside of the United States because they could be arrested. So we need to understand the implications of what this tribunal found, which is that the United States government is guilty of crimes against humanity. Now, it is important that we within the movement in the United States read the report of these international uh, commissioners. That we read it, we weaponize it, and we use it in the struggle. I don't intend to take any more time, but to say the report is historic it builds up it builds on the shoulders of william patterson and the work that was done with him and paul Robeson in 1951 but it resonates today this tribunal i encourage you to read and use the findings and recommendations. They are sp spelled out. Each finding is supported by evidence and you should use it in your proceedings. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lennox Hines. That was phenomenal. It was historic. Um, on the phone now uh, because we're having trouble connecting Elvis and Nadia that way, but if we can't get some one way, we'll get them the other. So I'm actually going to do something else while Olga is going to speak on the phone to us in a second, which is I'm going to try to share a screen. There we go. 
because here, because we won't be able to see all the uh, in her in her uh, house in, in San Juan right now. Uh, we'll see her here uh, with a photo with myself. We uh, have you and me, uh, and the woman uh, in the middle is actually the permanent ambassador of the people of Grenada, the country of Grenada, to the UN, who currently holds the position of the head of the decolonization committee. And with that note, I'll say um, that if you think about the United Nations and the decolonization committee in particular, and then the decolonization committee uh, in relationship to the people of Puerto Rico, there's really uh, no better uh, person to tell that story uh, than Professor Olga Sanabria, a, uh, a lawyer, uh, a, a, a lifelong advocate uh, for Puerto Rican uh, decolonization and independence. Olga has been uh, at the center of uh, all of the efforts, especially in the last uh, years, I won't say how many years, uh, to bring the voice of the uh, Puerto Rican people to the UN. Just a few days ago was the annual hearings that are now uh, semi-public hearings um, that, uh, amongst other things, uh, have declared, uh, you know, colonialism uh, to be the criminal act that it is, but also uh, to look at uh, the question of Puerto Rico, which is still not exactly an official colony by UN standards, but I'll let Olga tell that whole story, but also the decolonization committee uh, was utilized to uh, to help focus on all of the political prisons and especially the, uh, the free most recently of Oscar Lopez Rivera. So I'm sure I'm missing some things, but without further ado, let me try to put my phone on a high volume so that we can fully hear uh, the profound words. Uh, welcome so much, and thank you for being here, Sister Olga Sanabria de Villa. Hi, good evening to everyone, and I'm really happy uh, to also especially meet my co panelists. I'd like to thank uh, the Spirit of Mandela Coalition and Matt for inviting me to make the presentation, and also congratulate you on the initiative for the tribunal uh, in October. Um, so, with that introduction, again, reiterate how happy I am to be here. I'd also like to express solidarity from Puerto Rico to the, Black, to the Black Lives Matter movement, and I'd also like to express solidarity to the people of Palestine in this particular moment. Um, this is an optimal, mo an optimal moment for the presentation and discussion of the colonial case of Puerto Rico as an extreme case of human rights violations because colonialism is recognized by international law as contrary to human rights. And colonialism in these years has been intensified in the people. Instead of moving toward a decolonization process in the people, the uh, United States actually has intensified the colonial subordination of of Puerto Rico and thus has intensified the violation of human rights of the people of Puerto Rico. And in particular, I'd like to give right now the example of the imposition of a fiscal control board uh, over the government of Puerto Rico and that the purpose of this fiscal control board is actually to force the Puerto Rican people to pay the public debt which is mainly a public debt that is not what it is, and it's also a public debt that's mainly owed to Wall Street and Edwards. Um, so I think it's really important at this point that this conversation be taking place. I'd like to elaborate a little bit on the fiscal control board and the fact that the fiscal control board is has hierarchy over the government of Puerto Rico, the legislature of Puerto Rico. Uh, and it has imposed as a body that was appointed for the Puerto Rican people to pay the public debt. It has imposed draconian austerity measures that 
have undermined the social hierarchy of human rights in Puerto Rico. So I think it's really, really important to understand that instead of moving toward a decolonization process and enabling the people of Puerto Rico a process of self-determination, the United States has actually gone in the opposite direction in recent years. So that's the first point that I wanted to make. As stated by the Universal Declaration on Human Rights in its preamble, recognition of the inherent dignity and the equal and inalienable right of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. And here, we need to also understand how this is being violated in regards to the people of the people because of the colonial subordination of our people, which at every turn violates our dignity. Uh, and in general, by international law, it's recognized that colonialism and colonial subordination is a violation of human rights. The second article of the declaration states that no distinction shall be made on the basis of political, jurisdictional, or international status of the country or territory to which a person belongs, whether it be independent, a trust, non self governing, or under any other limitation of sovereignty. But again, colonial subordination in Puerto Rico does just that. It makes that distinction and actually makes Puerto Rico as a colony whose people are subordinate a, a distinction. And in fact, uh, besides being an example of the violation of human rights in general, I'd like to give the example of Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican United States citizenship. Puerto Ricans, even though we are United States citizens, we do not vote for the president of the United States. We do not vote for the Congress people of the United States. And yet, it is the laws of the United States that apply in Puerto Rico and have a higher hierarchy than the local laws. This doesn't mean that as an independent advocate that I am, that I would promote equal citizenship based on the Puerto Rican people being extended the right to vote in U.S. elections. But I'm just presenting this as an example. Another example is the fact that a district, uh, a district of Puerto Rico Federal United States Court imposes United States laws on the Puerto Rican people to this day, which means that in Puerto Rico, even though Puerto Rico has its own legal system, there's an extraterritorial court that imposes its laws on the Puerto Rican people. So that's another example. In Article 4 of the Declaration of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it stated that no one shall be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhumane, or debating treatment or punishment. And in this regard, um, I would imagine that everybody saw it on the chat. I brought up the issue of the Puerto Rican political prisoners who uh, engage in political armed actions against the colonial regime and against the uh, U.S. subordination of Puerto Rico, and they, it, it's recognized by international law in the preamble to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that it is essential if man is not to be compelled to have his recourse as a last resort to rebellion against tyranny and oppression, and this, pre this part of the preamble to the Universal Declaration actually explains that it's understood that oppression, colonialism, colonial subordination, oppression, human rights violations lead to violence, which is the case of the political business. And as I stated in the chat, the more contemporary political business those that were arrested in 
in 1954, served 29 and 25 years prison, while Oscar Lopez Rivera, who is part of a group of more decent political prisoners, served almost 38 years. So this is another example of cruel, inhumane, degrading treatment and punishment, and as a result, a violation of the human rights of the Puerto Rican people through our political prisoners. And our political prisoners, by the way, obviously are not common, common criminals. And this is also recognized in international law, the difference between common criminals, and I don't really like that term too, too much, but the, the international law makes that distinction between common prisoners and political prisoners who are imprisoned because of their actions to freedom. So this is the, the way that Puerto Rican political prisoners have historically been treated is another example of violation of Puerto Rican, of the human rights of Puerto Rican people. Um, article 16 of the Human Rights uh, Universal Declaration on Human Rights says that everyone has a right to a nationality. That's in the first part, and in the second part, it states no one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his nationality or denied the right to change his nationality. In the case of Puerto Rico, Puerto Rican uh, United States citizenship was imposed on the Puerto Rican people in, in 1917. And as a result of that, the Puerto Rican people, even though we have continued to develop our nationality because of the vibrancy of our culture, which has been forged for five hundred years, at the same time, we've been denied the ability to have a Puerto Rican passport. We have to bear the United States passport. So in the case of Puerto Rico, Nationality, which usually can coincide in most cases, in the case of Puerto Rico, nationality and citizenship do not coincide. When I travel and I'm asked my nationality, I put, I always write down, of course, I'm Puerto Rican. And then when migratory officials see my passport, they say, well, how can you say that you're Puerto Rican, but your passport is a U.S. passport? So this is the kind of situation that Puerto Ricans face regarding the issue of nationality. I don't want to extend myself on this issue, but there has, there has been a lot of struggle in Puerto Rico around this issue. And I just want to briefly mention that Juan Maribras, a very a visionary leader of the independence for more than 40 years, actually designed his U.S. nationality. As a result of that, he was able to prove that Puerto Rican citizenship does ex in fact still exist even though the United States denies us the right to bear a Puerto Rican passport. So that's another example of violation of the uh, human rights of the Puerto Rican people. Article 25 of the Declaration of Human Rights states in its first part, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself, his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care and necessary social services, the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond his control. Obviously, if this were written out, we could say his and her, but that was allowed at that point, at that time. But my point here that I would like to make is that the colonial structure in Puerto Rico is also a structure that impedes the socio-economic development of the Puerto Rican people. And that situation has been made worse by the fiscal control board that has imposed the draconian austerity measures, neoliberal neo measures against the Puerto Rican people. And this is a fiscal control board appointed by the United States President, he was, uh, the, the board was appointed by President Obama, and 
Um, it's also, it's a, a board that the Puerto Rican people do not vote for. And it's a board that actually now controls the Puerto Rican finances and fiscal matters, which was one of the few areas of, where the, of autonomy, one of the few areas where the Puerto Rican government could exercise autonomy. Because as a result of the establishment of the so-called Free Associated State Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, the colonial status was not eradicated, even though there were some very small changes, and this was one of them. But now, that even that small change was eradicated. Besides that, the Fiscal Control Board, in relation to the part of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights that I just signed it, the Fiscal Control Board has crushed workers' rights. It has deregulated the private sector, which has an impact on workers' rights, on the environment, on a series of issues. It has uh, facilitated privatization of state property, including recently the uh, electrical generation authority in Puerto Rico. And it has also dismantled facilitated dismantling of Puerto Rican institutions that have historically been pillars of Puerto Rican society. For example, the Puerto Rican Bar Association was established in 1825. And in 1840, I'm sorry, it was established in 1840. It's one of Puerto Rico's oldest civil society institutions. And historically, it's been a bar association that has not just limited its work to the rights of the lawyers and representing lawyers that they have problems and continued education, etc. This is a bar association that has historically been uh, involved in Puerto Rican civil and human rights. And it's also an institution that has had the position against the colonial status of Puerto Rico, as it has also actually promoted a procedural mechanism for the decolonization of Puerto Rico, which has gained ground throughout Puerto Rican society. But this is the institution that the fiscal, one of the institutions that the fiscal control board has practically dismantled. How has it done this with the Bar Association? A law was passed establishing that association with the bar was no longer mandatory. So, of course, that actually undermines membership in the, in the bar association, undermines its income, and besides this, the budget of the bar association has been cut down by the government, by the actionary government in Puerto Rico, and also more recently by the fiscal control group. So these are examples of how the Fiscal Control Board has actually undermined the human rights that have the categorization of social and economic rights, different from civil rights uh, such as the right to vote, the right to freedom of the press, the right to association, etc. So that's another example. Now, I'd like to also uh, state that throughout the colonial situation of Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico has endured social displacement, destruction of its agriculture, cultural oppression, extreme migration. There are, right now, there are 5 million Puerto Ricans in the United States. There are more Puerto Ricans in the United States than in Puerto Rico. People also endured military education, in particular, I'd like to mention Vietnam and Culebra, which are probably very much known by uh, the audience and panelists. Uh, and it is also uh, a degradation of our environment, national, national resources, besides racism and discrimination. We have no control in Puerto Rico over vital areas of the life of any nation, of any that includes the fact that we do not control our borders, our migratory and immigration processes, international relations and commerce, monetary issues, maritime laws, customs, labor relations, trade union organization, airspace and transportation, 
communication, and many other areas. This is all a flagrant by violation. It's all a flagrant colonial subordination of the people of Puerto Rico and the control of the development, cultural, economic, political, spiritual of the Puerto Rican people. So this is uh, part of the information that I want to bring to you tonight. I'm really grateful to have this opportunity and I hope that it's interesting to you and again my solidarity to the Black Lives Matter movement and in particular at this moment to Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much, Olga, for your presentation. Um, it was very intense and interesting um, sharing with us the struggles of the Puerto Rican people in regards to human rights violations, um, as well as political prisoner issues and um, nationality. Um, it's something that I personally definitely want to follow up on. And again, we do appreciate you joining us and your, for your presentation. Now we're going to introduce um, Dr. Joy James, who is part of the, who is the Abolition Collective Black Internationalist Unions, editor of the New Abolitionists and Imprisoned Intellectuals. Welcome, Dr. Joy James. Thanks. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Is there an echo with me? Nope. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to keep it brief. There's been so much that I've said that's been very rich and generative. Um, my thanks to Olga, to Drs. Patterson, Kwame, Hines, and for everyone who organized this venue, which is incredibly important. The three things that are coming to mind, I'm just going to summarize and live through what we've already heard because there's so much to reflect upon. The three things that come to mind are legacy, political strategy, and revolutionary love. I think, um, I know, we have over half a millennium, 500 years of resistance in the Americas against enslavement in terms of the black legacy of struggle. I know that there are strategies in that resistance, and a number of those strategies, legal, political, communal, have been you know discussed here. And I know that all of our struggles are motivated by our desires to love ourselves, our community, and love our deities. So to every guiding ancestor, every spiritual being, every sacrificed warrior, every tortured child of family who's brought us to this current moment of enlightenment, right? my gratitude and my appreciation for the education, but also the inspiration to continue struggling. So the things that I'm taking from, and I again, I want to sort of summarize what's been said, but also problematize a couple of things. If we, and we do have legacy, if we, and we do have strategies, if we, and we do have revolutionary love, what does that mean in an asymmetrical war against an imperial state? that has indicated that it's totally fine with enforcing genocidal politics, right? So as Dr. Heinz has pointed out, it is a rogue state, which is why we appeal to the international community, the international order, which is obviously in a state of disorder. We know that the United Nations is in Manhattan. We know that the U.S. is in arrears in terms of its payment. We know that it cuts deals behind the scenes, but it also pursues AFRICOM, which has come up in the chat. It also allows Eric Prince, a former Navy SEAL, to run a billion-dollar mercenary club, right? That rampages, you know, on behalf of capital across the world. So the U.S. is complicit in numerous crimes against humanity, and all of the speakers have well documented that, right? And it's desire to maintain colonial positions and its ability to engineer assassinations. We could start 61 with Patrice Lumumba, which led to Malcolm saying, chickens coming home to roost when JFK was assassinated. We could move forward and talk about the internal deaths, um, Medgar Evers in 63, Malcolm in 65, King in 68, Fred Hampton in 69, Dulce September in the early 1980s in South ha um, Africa, Chris Hani, well, she's assassinated in Europe, but part of the liberation movement. Chris Hani in 1993. So 
we have what I call trauma milestones in our memory banks, right? We have strategies, we have legacy, we have love, but also the trauma impacts our struggle. We have warriors who are still incarcerated. We have those who are suffering from cancer. Their names have appeared in the chat. Leonard Peltier, Sundiata Okulin, Tulu Shakur, Russell Maroon Schultz, Mumia Abdul-Jamal. There's, there's more whose names, right, that I'm forgetting in this moment, but that we all know. So what I want to problematize after thinking all of you for so much you've put on the table is really a question. It's, you know, where do we go from here, as King said, or, you know, what is to be done, as Lennon said. Lennon's not my favorite person, so I'm going to ride with King. But it's still the accumulation of 500 years of struggle is also a death march as well as a life march. We give birth, we struggle, we see our casualties, they get locked away, and we still continue to struggle. The question I have on the table, and it, I ask it humbly, how is it that we create connectors that amplify our struggle to the next level? As I remember what Sophia Bukhari said when we brought her to Brown years ago, right? And she's on a panel. She talked about being between the rock and the hard place when you're struggling, right? It's not just predatory violence from the state. There's also predatory violence that happens in the communities, but even more deadly, I would argue, because it is fascist, is the predatory violence from the white supremacist underground that's not underground anymore. So the January 6th, you know, performative coup, wannabe coup, was signaling to us, all of us collectively, as, as children of deities, as people who get to raise their kids and should grow old in freedom, but you know that's proven elusive, but the lack of prosecution against white supremacist terrorists, right, who've reinvented Christianity, so it's not just the rapture where, you know, Jesus comes and takes all the, quote, good people, which means they won't be Muslim, they won't be LGBTQ, they won't be, you know, women who are a feminist or womanist. They will definitely be black or indigenous or people of color, but now Jesus wants a genocide, right? So there's an ethnic cleansing, the genocide that everybody's talked about so concisely and with so much passion is not just an expression of the will of the state, it's an expression of the white supremacists that the state allows to roam and to accumulate weaponries, including like quite a bit of arsenal that seems to have been, quote, lost or stolen from military forces. So in this moment, I think of these stages that we mutate through, and since this is also the anniversary of Attica, I want to close out with a reflection on Attica, right? But before I do that, I want to read from Emil Carr Cabral, so we turn to the source, and we know um, at least, you know, from what I've been teaching and learning with my students, that it was the United States and it was Britain and NATO who decided that Portugal, who kick-started capitalism through the African enslavement and was the last one on the go of its colonial possessions, it was this unholy alliance between the U.S., Britain, and NATO that was backing Portugal and likely facilitated Cabral's assassination in 1973. So first, this quote from Cabral, who I see as an ancestor, reminds me that our struggles are always international, right? And that anti-blackness is global. First this quote, and then I want to talk briefly about Attica in my reflections that I'm doing with different collectives of people to close. From Cabral, we turn to the source. We recognize the devastations of lack of clean water, adequate food and shelter, but the cause of those deficits cannot be remedied through policy. If so, then there is no need for confrontation, only accommodation with colonialists and petitions for greater benefit packages. We know by now that even though the Democratic Party is preferable to the reinvented Republican Party as sort of, you know, um, not sort of, as a white nationalist, uh, kill the vote for black people and people of color and indigenous people, restoration of white um, terror sort of party. We know that 
the duopoly of those two parties cannot remedy, right, the predatory violence arrayed against our liberation struggles, but also our right to live and to care for our elders and care for our kids. So when I think about what the options are, particularly as a petty bourgeois academic, and I think we need to talk more about class divisions inside of our communities, because our class can shape some of our ideologies and also our willingness to struggle. So I always want to be clear, I, you know, I'm petty bourgeois, I have my contradictions. But having said that, in the reflections that I want to go into on Attica, and what I've been thinking about since Erica Garner died in uh, late 19, 2017, I believe, when I spent an entire year only giving talks on Erica Garner, I started thinking about the captive maternal, how we love our communities, how we care for them, how we care for ourselves, and our communities include the people incarcerated, include the intellectuals who are political warriors who fought those wars, and somehow the, the energy and the wealth that the petty bourgeoisie or the black bourgeoisie has um, even though we write books about them and give speeches on them, it has never that wealth has never returned to the source in terms of those who had, took the greatest risk and need the most support. So Attica, right? I saw in the chat it's the anniversary of George Jackson's assassination as well, right? So Attica is sparked in September after Jackson was killed in August. And I see the captive maternal that I said I studied when I, you know, it's like, how is it that Erica Garner's, you know, beautiful 27-year-old mother of two leaves us so quickly and transitions? Well, because there's a lack of support and there's too much trauma and grief in our movements that is not alleviated by those who have resources and leisure time to contribute. Again, I implicate myself. But in the captive maternal, I see an the ancestor Erica Garner, I, say, I see the captive maternal in the rebellion in Attica in 1971. The first stage is that of the coerced or conflicted caretaker. The incarcerated had to reproduce the prison through their labor. They were the ones who were maintaining the grounds, taking care of the meals, consoling each other, all the nurturing that all enslaved people perform for their communities out of love and commitment is stolen by the state to stabilize itself and its predatory accumulations. But at the moment of awakening, right, there is a protest. And so they will, we're here, which we always knew, right, despite 500 years of, of, of predatory violence under white supremacy and capital. And so we protest. And then the protest can be mobilized into a movement, the third stage, and the movement can move into Malinage. And so the way I see Attica and remember it on this anniversary as having the legacy, the strategy, and the love that you've all talked about very powerfully is that when they created the Maroon camp inside the prison, they took it over, they created medical, medic sites, they, political education, who would communicate with the press, the New York Times, writing the manifesto. We build communities out of nothing. We create worlds in dead zones, right? We create life where nothing should be born. That happens in Attica, but the state sees our human rights endeavors that you've powerfully talked about tonight as a declaration of war against an imperial racist state. So what does it do? It sends the National Guard in with military surplus from Vietnam to kill rebels who are community defenders and lovers, no matter how we get caught in our own losses and how we get caught in the predatory matrix of the state. So I'm wondering, right, we have the protests, we have the mobilizations, we have the movements, we are war resistors because we didn't start the war, the war comes to us. What is the next stage? Because we're rich in intellect and commitment, but it seems to me the next stage has to invent a new level of struggle that maybe has not, at least in my mind, clearly materialized. You know, maybe I've read too many Octavia Butler sci-fi novels or not enough of them, 
But there's a transcendent part to our struggle that is real because you can see the way we move as people and in coalitions. But we must call, I believe, and this is what I'm throwing out as a question, we'll figure out what we think we as a collective and we as small collectives need to do. We need to call ourselves to accountability. There's been a lot of money thrown into our movements to control our movements for corporations to accumulate prestige. I saw in the chat when people talked about Juneteenth, what next year there's going to be like a Juneteenth t-shirt, merchandise. Well, if that doesn't feed babies, you know, it doesn't buy you land. It doesn't create freedom schools. So the extent that our movements are constantly bought from under us, like gentrification, I would love to learn, as I've been learning all night, what's the next level of struggle in asymmetrical warfare, right? We have the love, we have capacity, we have legacy, and we have strategies. But I think without accountability and the ability to revoke the leadership status of people who accumulate out of the struggles of the most oppressed, which is not me, it is the incarcerated, it is the political prisoners, the prisoner of war, the veterans. I think without that accountability call, I think that we will face continued obstacles so that our loving is always seen as war, the predatory state uses all of its militarized violence. We've been in Iraq since 2003. All that training, all that deadly skill, all that homicidal rage has filtered back into the police forces in the U.S., right? To be used against us and the black extremity index fabricated, you know, justification for continued war. So I see our ideological warfare as important as our material struggle to feed our communities and to build marine camps within sites of occupation. But I would really like to learn more how it is that we call ourselves all to accountability and a collective discipline for those things that you've beautifully outlined, right? The legacy, right? The strategies that people wrote with their lives, their passion, and some, you know, with their assassinations and the love which we still maintain for each other despite our contradictions. I'll stop there. If I could just uh, take a minute to say wow and, and great thank yous, Dr. Joy James. We have obviously gone uh, a bit over, and uh, my main sadness about that is that uh, my co-MC and, and colleague on the coordinating committee of this work, along with several former political prisoners, Seiko Odinga, Jihad Abdul Mumit, and comrades uh, Dekwi Kiona Siddiqui and Eileen Weitzman, but Dr. Aisha Muhammad had to leave uh, early, so I will very, very quickly close out our evening. Um, first by saying another th thank you to Dr. Joy James for another of so many extraordinary contributions from Dr. James. I have to say, uh, as you said, all of the speakers, I think, uh, taught us so much and uh, brought us through this history. Um, but one of the reasons why I think uh, the coordinating committee suggested having Dr. James, uh, Sister Joy, last is that we knew that in addition to having been part of and, and, and very much part of the organizing committee, work of the October Tribunal, um, and that, yes, indeed, it is a tactical initiative uh, to build a more strategic goal of building mass and popular movements, as, as Comrade Julia Montecum just put into the chat. We also knew that Joy would present us with challenges beyond October and with questions for us to answer uh, collectively and in our movements uh, and in our nation's uh, yes, within the international scenario, uh, within the United Nations, but also understanding, as we have so pointedly heard tonight, uh, of the internal colonies, the, the prison house of nations that the empire is. So I'll just end uh, by saying that our job, in addition to taking up the challenges and 
and deeply pursuing the accountability questions that uh, Dr. Joy James presented to us, and honoring the work and the legacy of all of the speakers and the histories they represent to just raise uh, the voice of another ancestor, uh, Kwame Ture, Ture uh, who said, uh, there are three things we have to do, organize, organize, organize. And so for now, uh, www.spiritofmandela.org is the website. Go to that site and you'll see campaigns and pages where you can look at the easiest way to get individuals and grassroots groups involved, which is to endorse. Uh, also, you'll see a program booklet, which is our main way of raising funds. The third Saturday of every month is a public general meeting that we're holding. And if you're an endorser, uh, you'll get that information via email. Uh, and now to say uh, to all of you at this point, Dr. Aisha would have read a poem and said some prayers. So I'll just simply say thanks to all, blessings to all, and uh, see you on the streets, see you in the whirlwind. Thank you. Good night.